Welcome back to Advent of Code 2025. So for today's problem, we have a diagram displayed on a grid with a location marked as S, which seems to be where a beam enters moving downward. And then the beam will pass freely through the uh, dots. And if they hit a carrot, that will split the beam and the beam will stop there and it will emit two new beams, one on its direct left and one on its right. And so, for example, the beam coming from S will hit the top splitter, split into two beams. Those will each hit their own splitters. Those will then split into three beams as the left and right splitters will both emit a beam in the middle, and then so on and so forth. And the answer that we need to provide is the number of times the beam splits in total. And so we are not double counting. Um, so we are not undouble counting. These, this still counts as two splits, and then this counts as three splits and not four. So once we get our grid of characters, uh, we can find the S position. Like so. Um, and then what we can do from there is keep track of all of the current beam head locations. So that starts at just S, and then each time we take the next beam head, move it down. And then if we hit a splitter, we terminate that beam and spawn two new beams, one on its left and one on its right. And then for efficiency purposes, we can keep a set of scene positions to avoid both to A, avoid hitting a splitter multiple times, and B, avoid tracking the same path multiple times. So let's say that the beams are initially just S, and then we can say while, uh, or I guess we would want to use a Q for that. So we can say beams equals a new Q containing just S, and then while we are tracking more than one beam, we will say beam or RC equals beams dot pop left. And then if it's at the end of the grid, so if R is equal to length of the grid minus one, then we'll skip it and because we've already hit the bottom of the grid, um, I suppose we do need to check whether or not there's a splitter at that position. So I guess if grid RC is a dot, we'll have to handle dots and splitters differently anyway. So if it's a dot there and the row is already equal to the bottom of the grid, then we'll just skip. And otherwise, we will add the next position, which would just be the beam moving down. So we increase the row by one. And if the grid has a carrot there, then that's a beam splitter. So uh, we'll put a beam on the left and a beam on the right. Um, and the problem, I don't know if it specifies what we should do if there's a splitter at the very edge of the grid, but I think for now we can assume that that won't happen. And if it does come up, then we'll figure it out later. So then we can just do beams.append rc minus one and beams dot append rc plus one and then to avoid the duplicate processing issue um what we can do is just if rc in or sorry i guess it would have to go here um uh, we'll need to do this three times in total so let's make a utility function for this if rc is already been seen then we skip it otherwise we'll add it to the scene set and to the beam queue and so then we can just call add here uh, 
like so. And then each time we hit a splitter, we want to increase our count. So we can just do that here. see what that gives us. All right, it gives us a value of zero. So let's see where our beam is traveling. We start at zero seven. Ah, yes. Um, we need to do that, I suppose. Um, and that gives us 21. And that'll get us our answer for part one. Okay. The word quantum here slightly scares me because it implies we might need to be doing a large amount of parallel computations. Okay. So we see that only a single tachyon particle is sent to the manifold. So not a beam, just a single particle. And it takes both the left and the right path of each splitter encountered. So it's superposition, I guess. And okay, so each time it splits, there is a timeline in which it went left and another timeline in which it went right. And what we need to know is the number of timelines active after a single particle completes all of its possible journeys. Okay. Okay, interesting. I think what we can do here is what we're essentially trying to do is determine the number of timelines that are reached from a splitter and i think we can do that by simply adding up the number of timelines that can be reach, reached by the whatever happens on the left and whatever happens on the right. So I think we can do this using a memoized function. So let's copy over the input section, but all of the rest of this will probably not be relevant, I believe. We will want functals cache for our memoization to prevent doing duplicate computations. So we want a cached function that can go from a specific row and column position and return the number of timelines from that position. I think that makes sense. Okay, so if the position is equal to a dot, then we are equal to a or equal to uh, s, then we'll simply pass the beam down. So we'll just return solve r plus 1c. Um, and I suppose if we've exceeded the grid, so if r is greater than length grid, then we'll simply return 1, as the number of timelines is simply the beam hitting the bottom of the grid. And then if the grid, if we reach a splitter, then we will want to solve the left side and the right side. That seems too good to be true, but let's see if this, let's see if we have any luck with this. Okay. Index error here. It's because I failed the one off 40. And big number as expected. And all right, looks like that's all there is for part two as well. So yeah, once again, memoized functions are very powerful for problems like this. But yeah, basically, long story short, what cache does is it saves the result of the function. So if we call solve again with the same R and C as before, it will remember what the answer was the last time. So if we remove this, then it becomes extremely inefficient because it's doing a lot of duplicate computations. Uh, that's caused by splitters dumping their beams into the same column. But as long as we memoize our function, 
becomes as simple as looking at our current position and what object is at that position on the grid, what are the possible paths that we could take from that point, and then we just recursively solve from that position. So thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow for day eight.